today we are talking about the state of women's football in the UK, exclusively for England and Wales. And is there some untapped potential? As the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023 has now faded into the sunset, it is time to look at how women's football came to be in the United Kingdom, particular England and Wales, and how it evolved since its inception. What is it like now? And where is it going? Does it have potential? If so, in which areas? How is UK women's football structured in particular to resolve disputes? Are you ready for a ride? Women's football in England has a troubled history. It is one of frustrating steps ahead and then backwards. The first known example of a team game involving a ball, which was made out of a rock, occurred in old Mesoamerican cultures over 3,000 years ago. It was called Chachali by the Aztecs. On some ritual occasions, the ball would symbolize the sun and the captain of a losing team would be sacrificed to the gods. A unique feature of the Mesoamerican ball game was a bouncing ball uh, made of rubber. No other early culture had access to rubber. It is unknown whether both male and female humans used to play Chachali together then. Fast forward to the middle of the 19th century when football or soccer, um, as the game is called in some parts of the world, in its current form arose in England. An attempt to create proper rules for the game was made at a meeting in Cambridge in 1848, but no final decision regarding all questions about rules was achieved then. Another important event in the history of football occurred on 26 October 1863, when the Football Association, the FA, was formed in the Freemasons Tavern on Great Queen Street in London. It is the oldest football association in the world and is responsible for overseeing all aspects of the amateur and professional game in its territory. Indeed, the FA is the governing body of association football, more commonly known as football or soccer, in England, and the crown dependencies of Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man. The FA is now a member of both the Union of European Football Association, the UEFA, which is one of six continental bodies of governance in association football, and the Fédération Internationale de Football Association, which is French for International Association Football Federation, FIFA, which is the international governing body of association football. So there's FIFA at the very top, then there's UFA for European territories, and then there's a football association for England and Wales. As early as 1895, a representative football match between Northern and Southern women's team was recorded in London in the UK. By 1921, women's football had become increasingly popular through the charitable games played by women's teams during and after First World War. In a move that was widely seen as caused by jealousy of a crowd's interest in women's games, which frequently exceeded that of the top men's teams in 1921, the FA banned all women's teams from playing on grounds affiliated to the FA. The reason given for such a ban was that the FA thought football was unsuitable for females, sick, and damaged women's bodies. Women continued to play football between the two world wars, but there was no league structure and there were few dedicated facilities for women. The decision to exclude women from football was only reversed in 1969, when after the increased interest in football caused by England's 1966 World Cup triumph, the Women's Football Association, the WFA, was founded to re-establish the female game. 
But WFA was an independent body and not part of EFA. Indeed, he took an order from UEFA to force the FA to remove its restrictions on the playing rights of women's teams. So in 1972, the FA, with a strong encouragement of the UEFA, lifted its ban on women playing on football league grounds in England. It was not until 1983 that the WFA was able to affiliate with the FA as a county association. The WFA made rich strides in the fledging international competitions and even took an England side to the European Championship final in 1984. The WFA grew the women's game throughout the 70s, the 80s and early noughties. However, it was unable to develop the game at grassroots levels due to limited funding. Only in 1993 did the FA set up the Women's Football Committee to run women's football in England. The Women's Football Conference, as it is now known, has representation on the FA Council equivalent to a county football association. So the FA assumed governance of the women's game in 1993. The 1993-1994 season saw the WFA Cup brought under the control of the FA, 137 teams entered. A year later, the WFA's National League and League Cup were also managed by the FA. This saw the birth of the Women's Premier League. Coming under the wing of the FA in 1993 was a tangible benefit to women's football. It allowed women's clubs to draw fully on the development opportunities offered by the FA. It gave clubs an incentive to improve their standards and gain the FA's charter standard status, which signifies that a club has achieved a quality benchmark and which demonstrates to the public, club members and players' parents, that the club is well organised. It has assisted in promoting women's football to the wider public, and it has enabled links to be built with professional men's clubs. In 1993, there were only 80 girls' teams, no professional players, no football development, and little funding in England and Wales. However, since 1993, the game has progressed and developed throughout the country, and the England women's senior team has participated at the highest level. FIFA introduced the Women's World Cup competition in 1991, and as the women's game started to grow globally, the decade culminated in the finals in the USA in 1999, but featured sold out stadiums and a 90,000 crowd at the final. In the last 20 years, leagues and competitions have been formed throughout the country to form a thriving pyramid of women's football. By 2002, it had become the top female team participation sport in England. In 2005, England hosted the UEFA Women's Euro. Records for a crowd attendance and TV audiences were smashed. England beat Finland 2-1 to one in front of a then European record crowd of 29,092 people at the City of Manchester Stadium. Crucially, the talent pool got deeper. There were now England teams at various age groups and the senior team, the Lionesses as they are called, were beginning to show their talents on the world stage. The 2000 ended with the senior team winning the Cyprus Cup, which was the first international trophy, and later in the same year, reached the final of UEFA Women's Euro 2009, albeit losing out to Germany, who were the dominant force at the time. The women's under 18, however, won the UEFA Championship in Belarus, in 2009. In 2011, further to club football reformation, the FA Women's Super League, WSL, was set up as initially an eight-team summer competition. This replaced the FA Women's Premier League National Division as the highest level of women's football in England and ran on this basis until 2017, when it finally grew into the two division, i.e. WSL, Women's Super League, and Women's Championship. 
So it grew into the two division, fully professional game we know today, which encompasses WSL and women's championship. The WSL takes its place alongside the traditional men's professional season with media interest, spectator levels and sponsorship income, having established a solid commercial platform. The top three teams each season qualify for the UEFA Women's Champions League. The WSL has increased the visibility of women's club football across the world, attracting star players from overseas and broadcast partners in Australia, Canada, Dominican Republic, Mexico, Germany, Italy, Scandinavia, New Zealand and the USA. Below the two professional divisions, the game's pyramid the Women's National League has continued to develop. It now means that there are recognized pathways into the women's professional game, with clubs themselves operating academy structures. The last 10 years have seen major developments for both women and girls playing football. In 2014, England women played their first match at the new Wembley Stadium attracting a then record crowd of 45,619 people for their match against Germany. The senior team was by now a serious contender on both the European and world stages. They took bronze in the 2015 FIFA Women's World Cup in Canada and reached the semi-finals of UEFA Women's 2017 Euro and got to the same stage again in the FIFA Women's World Cup two years later in France. 2019. The semi-final defeat to the USA attracted a record 11.7 million viewers on BBC One. Earlier in the same year, they won the She Believes Cup for the first time. This success saw ever-increasing crowds at England matches, with 77,786 fans at Wembley to see the senior team face Germany in November 2019. Double participation, double the fan base, and consistent success on the world stage. Those were the three goals in the game plan for growth, the FA's first formal strategy for women's and girls' football in England, unveiled in March 2017. If you want to have a look in detail at some of the quotes I'm making, in particular, game plan for growth, or if you want to know more about the She Believes Cup, for example, well, you can read the article version of uh, this uh, webinar, this uh, podcast on our websites. So crefavi.com for the English version and crefavi.fr for the French version. And for the modest sum of 100 pounds or 100 euros in per year, you can have access to all our dense and numerous database of articles and have a look at all these, uh, these links that I was mentioning. So according to the FA, all three goals for the game plan for growth have been scored with now 1 million girls aged 5 to 15 and 1.9 million women who are above 17 years old who play the game in England. Numerous FA participation programs are bringing girls to football at various age groups and the fan base continues to grow. In October 2021, the UK and England in particular agreed to relocate 35 young Afghan female football players and their families after they escaped Afghanistan from the Taliban and then Pakistan. Following the above mentioned first three years strategy, a new one called Inspiring Positive Change was launched in October 2020. Among its eight goals, one stands out to give every school going girl the same access to football as boys, whether at schools or in clubs. A home win at Wembley in the UEFA Women's Euro 2022 in front of a crowd of 87,192 fans has firmly established the women's game in the national psyche. Media coverage and general interest in the women's game have never been higher. The FIFA Women's World Cup 2023 took place until the 20th of August 2023 in Australia and New Zealand, with Spain and England securing qualifications for the finals, and Spain ultimately winning the World Cup. 
Football Australia lauded FIFA Women's World Cup success and ticket sales passed 1.7 million. What is the corporate governance of women's football in the UK, in England and Wales? As mentioned before, women's football in England is now managed by the FA. So let's delve into the 733 pages FA handbook in order to clarify the FA's corporate structure and the place of women's football within it. The FA is structured as a private company limited by shares called Football Association Limited, which was incorporated on the 23rd of June, 1903. It is headquartered at Wembley Stadium in Wembley, London. Indeed, a company limited by shares is a preferred format for sports clubs engaged in commercial enterprise, seeking to generate profit for shareholders and or raising finance from external investors. The FA main commercial assets are its ownership of a rights to the England national football team and the FA Challenge Cup. But broadcasting income remains the FA's largest revenue stream with both domestic and international broadcasting rights for England fixtures and the FA Cup tied up. Indeed, the annual report of financial statements for the year ended 31st of July 2022 of the Football Association Limited sets out that broadcast, sponsorship and licensing revenues are a fundamental enabler to achieving our strategic goals, accounting for over 80% of our turnover. Any risk to this revenue stream will impact the investments we can make in the game. The AFA also makes money from winning and hosting tournaments. In its 2022 annual accounts, Football Association Limited sets out that the results for the year are also materially impacted by the different financial results of the UEFA Eurofinals. The FA made a £6.8 million profit for coming runner-up in the men's tournament versus a loss of £2 million for winning the women's tournament due to significantly lower price money on offer. Across the two financial years, we have made £2.7 million of profit for hosting both tournaments, although this is reflected in a profit in financial year 2021 and a loss in the financial year 2022. Within the FA handbook, we find the women's football pyramid regulations, which apply to girls and women's clubs and leagues sanctioned by the FA and or an affiliated association, which is an association which is either a county association or a other football association, as such terms are defined in the FA handbook. So we find the football pyramid regulations, which apply to girls and women's club and uh, leagues sanctioned by the FA in membership of the women's football pyramid. So the aims and objectives of the women's football pyramid are to provide clubs with a level of competitive football appropriate to their playing ability, stadium ground facilities, economic means, and geographical locations. To provide a framework for discussion on matters of policy and common interest to leagues and clubs, and to allow the seasonal movement of clubs. Today, the level of the women's football pyramids are the WSL, Women's Sports League, um, at the very top in Tier 1. Then you've got the Women's Championship, which is Tier 2. Uh, then you've got the FA Women's National Leagues Regional North and South Divisions, which are the third level of a pyramid. Then you have the FA Women's National League Division 1, North, Midlands, Southeast, Southwest, which are the fourth tier, Tier 4. Then the eight regional Premier Divisions, which are in Tier 5. Then you've got the 18... Divisions 1, which are in Tier 6, and the eight county leagues, which are in the seventh and last level of a pyramid. So this is this, this women's pyramid, uh, football pyramid, is set out in Appendix 1 of the women's football pyramid regulations set out in the FA handbook. The women's FA Cup secured its first four-year sponsorship deal with SSC, in 2015, which consequently expired in 2019. In 2020, health and life insurance provider Vitality became the new title sponsor of the Women's FA Cup. 
on a three-year deal. However, despite sponsorship, entering the tournament actually costs clubs more than they get in prize money. In 2015, it was reported that even if Notts County had won the tournament outright, the £8,600 winnings would leave them out of pocket. The winners of the Men's FA Cup in the same year received £1.8 million, with teams not reaching the first round proper getting more than women's winners. In the 2022 annual accounts, the FA, Football Association Limited, announced a new landmark investment into the Vitality Women's FA Cup that will increase the prize fund to £3 million per year. The new agreement was introduced from the start of the 2022-2023 season and results in greater investment across the women's professional and grassroots games. In view of his ongoing wide economic discrepancies between female and male football teams, private equity firms and investment funds are sensing a new opportunity here and investing more and more in women's football teams because they are still cheap and good value. For example, there is a new club coming to women's professional football in the United States called Bay FC, based in San Francisco, if I remember well. It is backed by institutional investors, which are majority owners of that new team. As set out in its uh, 2022 annual accounts, the Women's Football Board manages all strategic and operational matters relating to women's and girls football within the policy framework and budget set by the FA's board. This, however, excludes the management of the FA Women's Super League and FA Women's Championships, which have their own board. Indeed, the Women's Super League and FA Women's Championship board was established in 2019 and has specific responsibility for managing FA Women's Super League and FA Women's Championship competitions. The current sponsor of the Women's Super League and FA Women's Championship is the financial institution Barclays. In its 2022 annual accounts, the Football Association Limited announced that Barclays will invest more than £30 million in women's and girls football over a period from 2022 to 2025, doubling the initial commitment Barclays took when it became the title sponsor of the WSL in 2019 and setting a new record for investment in UK women's sport. This will continue to build the Barclays Girls Football School Partnerships, which has already reached 55% of schools. In 2022, the FA also teamed up with Barclays to deliver the inaugural biggest ever football session with over 90,000 girls from schools across England playing football as part of the Let Girls Play campaign. Also, note the FA in its 2022 annual accounts, the BBC and Sky Sports broadcast deals for the Barclays Women's Super League started with a peak of 2.7 million viewers across the first six matches and 1.2 million viewers for Manchester United versus Manchester City, the FA's highest ever live broadcast figures. In the 2022 annual accounts, it is telling to read the results of the 2021-2022 season for England's women's senior team. They won all their matches, FIFA World Cup qualifications, Arnold Clark Cup, International Friendly, UEFA Women's Euro 2022, except for one game against Spain at the Arnold Clark Cup where the game ended with a deadlock, 0-0. Zero, zero. So while the FA's formula to bring women's football in England to the top seems to be working, the women's senior team has yet to defeat the Spanish women's team, who ultimately beat England in the final off and won the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup in August this year. Okay, so we've looked at the trouble history, the corporate structure of women's football in England and Wales. Now let's have a look at how football disputes are resolved within women's football in England and Wales. When players play, 
There may be some issues during games, which may be sanctioned by red cards received by players bound faulty. For example, English forward Lauren James was bound for two games after a red card against Nigeria and had to miss England's quarterfinal against Colombia, as well as the semi-final against Australia in the FIFA World Cup 2023. Several mechanisms exist to resolve football-related disputes in England. For men's professional football, the relevant dispute resolution procedures can be found in the English Football League, the EFL regulations, so called the EFL regulations. The rules of the association, the FA rules, which are found in the previously mentioned FA handbook, and the standard EFL contract, the EFL contract. Since pursuant to regulation 64.2 of the EFL regulations, all contracts entered between EFL clubs and players must be in the form of the EFL contract. However, the women's football in the UK and in England and Wales in particular, I was told by the EFL that they do not get involved in resolving disputes relating to female footballers and female clubs, female football clubs. Therefore, I can only assume, since the FA's legal team repeatedly refused to confirm as much by either email or phone call to me when I reached out to them in August and September 2023, thank you so much, BEFL, bunch of bastards, uh, that the relevant dispute resolution procedures for women's football in, in England and Wales can be found in the FA rules in the FA handbook. Okay, so to resolve disputes relating to women's football, you apply the dispute resolution procedures found in the FA rules in the FA handbook. Players may be involved in various types of disputes and each will uh, be resolved in a different way. So broadly, there are three types of disputes, employment related disputes, disciplinary disputes and other disputes. Generally, football related disputes are dealt with by way of arbitration and specialist tribunals and will rarely end up before national courts. Think about the reputational damage if an FA dispute ends up in court, which is completely public. So in relation to employment related disputes, those are the disputes which arise between players and their clubs, uh, which are their employers. They might include, for example, disagreements over the club's treatment of a player, payment or termination. If a player is unhappy with a club, they can follow the grievance procedure set out in the employment contract, which is usually the standard playing contract with capital S, P and, and C, so standard play contract, under which a player is entitled to have any grievance in connection with the, the employment heard. So the dissatisfied player should bring their concerns to the attention of a manager informally who will make inquiries and reach decision. If a player is not satisfied with the outcome, they may serve a formal notice of grievance to the club secretary and it will then be determined by the club's chairman or board. Conversely, a club may be able to take disciplinary action against a player under the disciplinary procedures set out in the employment contract in the standard playing contract when they consider the players to have breached the employment contract or any applicable rules. A player may appeal any internal disciplinary sanction to the club's board of directors and if dissatisfied, any sanction in excess of an oral warning can be appealed to the player-related dispute commission. Both clubs and players then have a final right of appeal to the League Appeals Committee, whose decision is final. Whether disagreement between a player and a club is more serious, or where the grievance disciplinary procedures have not been effective, terminating the employment contract may become possible or even necessary. A clause in the employment contract gives a player the right to terminate the contract where the club has seriously or persistently breached the terms of the contract and or failed to pay the player the remuneration due under the contract. The clause of the employment contract gives clubs a similar right to terminate where the player is found to have committed gross misconduct or fails to comply with a final warning under the club's internal disciplinary procedure or is found to have committed a criminal offence where the punishment consists of an immediate prison sentence of three months more or more. Both the club and player have a 
right to appeal against such termination to the League Appeals Committee. There is also a final right of appeal to the League Appeals Committee. For other employment-related disputes which fall outside the grievance, disciplinary and termination procedures, the employment contract provides for that any dispute between the club and player will be settled by way of arbitration. The club and the player can, by mutual agreement, opt for their dispute to be referred to arbitration and the Rule K arbitration of the FA rules, which follow a well-defined procedure. Indeed, Section K of the FA rules, more commonly referred to as Rule K, provides that any dispute between two or more participants shall automatically be referred to and resolved by arbitration and of the FA rules. Participants is widely defined in the FA rules and includes, among others, authorized agents, licensed agents, who are now also covered by the defined term intermediaries and uh, the current FA rules. It also includes managers, competitions, clubs, players, and all such persons who are from time to time participating in any activity sanctioned either directly or indirectly by the FA. Now let's turn our attention to disciplinary disputes. A player may be subject to disciplinary proceedings initiated by the FA. The FA is the principal body responsible for dealing with disciplinary matters in English football, including for women's football. Pursuant to rule G, George, G31 of the FA rules, facts which give rise to an alleged breach of the FA rules will be dealt with by the FA under the FA rules. The FA thus has authority to initiate disciplinary proceedings against players in respect of any misconduct, including breaches of the laws of the game and the FA's rules and regulations. At first instance, a disciplinary matter which falls under the FA's jurisdiction will be decided by a regulatory commission which has the power to sanction a player with, for example, a reprimand, a warning, a fine, or a suspension from football activity for a specified period or number of matches. Both players and the FA have a right to appeal a decision of a regulatory commission to an appeal board. In general, an appeal board's decision is considered to be final and binding. However, in exceptionally rare cases, it may be possible to challenge the validity of an appeal board decision by way of a FA Rule K arbitration. Finally, let's have a look at how other disputes are dealt with uh, by VFA within women's football. So for disputes falling outside of the employment or disciplinary categories, such as disputes between a player and their agent, or a dispute between a player and their former club over a mutual termination agreement, players can file a FA Rule K arbitration. Rule K provides that save for those which have their own dispute resolution mechanism, any dispute or difference between any two or more participants shall be referred to and finally resolved by arbitration and of his rules. As the term participant is widely defined, a, as mentioned and before, the scope of disputes covered by Rule K is thus extremely wide. Rule K arbitration tribunal have broad powers to resolve disputes and their decisions are final and binding. So to conclude, women's football in England and Wales is now extremely well equipped and structured via VFA to take over the world of women's professional football and expand its reach in the media and on broadcasting channels during international tournaments and in the public eye. The sky is the limit for women's professional football and England and Wales are extremely well placed in exploiting such burgeoning opportunity. That's it for me for this week. Talk to you soon, everyone. Bye.